great beauty of her complexity. Mm -hmm. Given how, given how always seems to lead no. to something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I see it. Here we go. It says live. Are we live? Okay. You want me to start? Yes, sir. And which camera am I talking to? Right there. Okay. Very good. My name is Kim Belfour. I'm going to be doing a timber framing demonstration this evening. Um, using hand tools only. Uh, this is a what's referred to as square rule timber framing, which is actually the modern timber framing technique. When I say modern, it's post-1820. Before 1820, there was a different technique. Uh, if time allows, later on, I'll show you some pictures. Uh, but the key point here is that uh, the modern timber framing technique allows us to use um, more interchangeability of the of the components where if uh, the older technique required you to actually scribe f timbers together which um, made it a unique unique tie beam into a post and a unique brace now I can do with this technique I uh, use more interchangeability within the timbers so I think uh, I want to talk a little quick a little bit quickly about some of the tools what you can see here is my chisel hammer and square very critical components. This chisel is a pre-1900 chisel. Um, there are modern chisels available to do the same thing. I prefer the older style chisels. Um, the, uh, the square is, is very common, commonly referred to as a timber frame, as a s framing square. Um, this is a, a modern one. Here's an example of uh, another one that I have. This one actually has a stamp of 1805, which is back in the scribe rule era. Of timber framing so it gives you an indication of inch and a half here two inches here inch and a half here two inches here those are common dimensions of mortises and tenons this is a two inch frame so I can use my framing square to lay out two inches and then two inches if I'm doing a smaller timber I'd use the inch and a half go inch and a half inch and a half uh, that is truly uh, these are framing squares. The other way you can use this frame, it's a two inch mortise. I can strike the mortise using the two inch dimensions. So it's, it's, these are, though it's a modern tool, it's been around for a very long time. The other thing that's fascinating is down one side, down one side of this uh, square is a series of numbers. A very few people know what they mean. These actually are used in, um, for your, uh, your braces. Over here we have a brace, okay, that I've made. That's a mortise and tenon. It's got the tenons on the end. This brace is a 30-inch brace. If I look at my square and it says 30-30, right here it says 42 and four, 42 inches and 43 one hundredths. That is actually the hypotenuse of a right triangle, representing 30 inches. And you say, well, where's the 30 inches? The 30 inches is from this point to this point on the frame. That's the bottom of my tie beam down to where the bottom of the brace will be. So I'm going to be walking through some of the um, methods used for cutting some of this joints, these joints. Um, I've done a lot of prep work in advance for this, so you'll not see 100% uh, of the work done. But hopefully we can get through this in our little, uh, in our little presentation here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to finish this particular joint. I've already done the backside. Uh, this is a tenon. Uh, this is a, I'll call it a simulated post. And what I'm just really going to do is just harvest, cut these pieces off here. And I'm r basically roughing down to my line because I use my square. I use my square to uh, lay out my lines. And what I'm doing here is just working my way across, taking the bulk of this material off, doing it quickly this way. And then I'm going to get a slightly different chisel. This is referred to as a slick. And uh, as big as it is, we never strike this with a hammer. This is a hand tool. I am going to, uh, all I'm going to do here is use this to kind of it gets the high spots off. 
Ultimately, you can see my line down here. That's where I want to end up. But this allows me to do that very quickly. Move to the other side very quickly. And these chisels are all very sharp. So I'm looking at my line here. I'm looking at my line down here. I'm good along this edge. I've still got quite a bit toward the back. So I need to go get that. Because you say, well, what, what's so critical about it? Well, this has to fit in a two inch mortise. This is my tenon that is going in the mortise. This is an example of a mortise up here. And this is the tenon. This particular tenon is what I'll call simulating a, uh, the top of a post. I do not, and uh, the plate, which is the horizontal part that the rafters sit on in a building, uh, the plate will, will sit on this particular tenon. Now, that feels fairly straight. Ultimately, I need to connect these two points. I don't want anything in the way. Now, I feel it rocking a little bit. The oxidation of the square tells me this is high here. So I can come over here and get that off of there. Let's try it again, see how I did. Ultimately, I only want to touch on the sides. You can see I'm still high a little bit there. So I'm going to take that off of there. And one, of the, one other thing we do, I'm going to cheat a little bit. We love to make jigs. We love to make jigs. So I have a jig that is two inches. So I can put this on here and say, okay, well, I'm pretty good there, but my corner, look at that. So I'm saying that's a two inch wide, 12 inch long jig. And I'm saying my tenon is really good there now. Okay. So I'm done. I'm not going to do any, I'm not going to take any more off of that. Uh, the other thing, I want to finish that particular joint. So I'm going to, part of this new technique of timber framing in, uh, involves doing what we called housings. I have another jig. Like I said, we love, we love our jigs. This is a, a square that allows me to get a specific dimension here. So I'm going to get this dimension. I'm going to put it up here. I'm going to put it here. And now I need to take this. I need to take that dimension. And then now I need to put this timber on the ground. OK, because I need to remove this down to that line. Um, I'm going to put this down on the ground. And I'm going to use my ads. You're going to be able to see this here. Or do you want me to move over a little? Now I could easily do this just by doing a 45 degree angle back here and uh, doing it all that way. And that is what I'll call the quick and dirty way of doing it. But this right here, after you see what I'm doing, you realize that this is a, it gives it a nice radius and it looks so much nicer. And if you look at historic timber frames, this is quite common as a method for transitioning from the overall dimension of the timber. This is an eight by eight and I need to reduce it. I need to reduce it to seven and a half. So I'm just doing that simple little adjustment there. Now let's put it back up on the horse. By the way, this is about a 80 pound, very green piece of pine here. So you can see I need to remove a little more. This is a, this is a, uh, a spoke shave. This is one way to do it. I did leave quite a bit of meat there. Normally we try to take a little bit more off, but 
but by using the spoke shave, we can clean this up, get kind of the, some of the roughness out of this. And one of the things I'll say that you have to do is you, you can't just use it squarely. You really need to be on an angle with it. It all depends on the grain. You have to see where the grain wants to take the, the tool. You can't fight the grain. You've got to go where the, the wood wants to take you. So you can see I've pretty much dealt with this line out here, a little bit over here to go. So basically what I'm doing is I'm creating my tenon that is ultimately going into a mortise. I'm going to stop there because I'm not using that joint, but that's kind of how that's laid out. And when this, this is a post, so when it's standing up, you're going to look and see that very natural curve up at the top as it sits into the tie beam or the plate that sits on top of that. Um, the other thing we always do is we always chamfer because when we put this together, I know it's the right size, but by chamfering it just makes it start together very easily and then you can go from there. The, uh, the next thing I want to do here is the uh, I want to finish this right here. You can see how I've reduced this. I'm reducing it from eight to seven and a half. Um, and somebody will say, well, why do you bother? Well, if you buy rough cut wood, the wood is, the wood is almost never exactly eight inches. Could be a little more, could be a little less. So within an eight by eight, there is an ideal timber that is somewhat smaller. So I'm going to go to eight and a half, uh, seven and a half. So this has been laid out down to seven and a half inches. The nice thing here I'll say is that my grain is pretty straight. There's no knots in this region, which is kind of unusual. So, but when I'm laying out the timbers, I go out of my way to try to because I know where my mortises are going to be, I know where my tenons are going to be, there's another mortise down here. I try to stay away from the knots because the knots are going to make life difficult for you. So now that I've got this kind of roughed out, I'll come back with a chisel again and I will rough it out. Now I could do it with a two inch chisel or I could come back and use my slick again. Everybody says, oh, that took such a cool tool. Well, the reality is it's kind of expensive. Some of these can be two to three hundred dollars. I would never pay that, but some people do. Um, but all I need is a two-inch chisel to do this job. I don't have to have this. It's just nice to use. And once again, you see my line there, it's just barely disappearing. The man who taught me how to timber frame, I asked him, well, how close to the line should you be? And he says, I want you to cut half the line. I want you to cut half the line. Now that's kind of tough to do, but we try to get as close to that as we can. So where are we here? Looks good there. So I've got that part done. So then you say, well, is it really done? Just like on that tenon over there, I need to make sure that I don't have any high spots in the middle. I want to be able to touch just the edges. There's a little concavity here, which is okay. Uh, it's, it's down a little under an eighth of an inch in the middle, which is fine. The reality is that'll never be seen. That is completely covered. But it makes it so you're never going to have any issues when you're putting together. It's, it's tight on the edges, which is all you're going to see. Okay. Next thing I want to show you here, we're going to do it on a different side. Right here. This right here is a brace pocket for the plate. You can see where your plate is going to come on. This tenon is going to go this way. The brace is going to be on a 45 degree angle going up. So I'm actually going to drill a hole there. I'm going to use my Miller's Falls boring machine. Uh, Miller's Falls boring machine circa, I'd say, 
I believe this was invented somewhere around on 1890, 1880 in that range. Uh, this is a two inch mortise. I'm using a two inch bit and I'm getting it. I have this depth set. This is the depth stop. Um, it's a four inch deep mortise and I've got about a five eighths inch housing on the side. So I'm approximately four and five eighths inch deep. So I lined it up on either side of my marked area. There's three steps in laying these joints out. You got to mark it with a pencil. You, so you mark it, you score it, and then you bore it. Scoring, I actually take a chisel and run down the edge of it. If you don't take the chisel, you'll tear out past your line. By putting the chisel mark on the pencil line, you don't exceed the, the dimension there. What's pulling the bit into the hole as I'm drilling is a little bit of a threaded tip on this. You've seen those, everybody's seen those on the end of bits, drill bits, uh, the wood bits. The, and basically I'm just drilling a hole, which is going to be approximately four and five eighths deep. Now, if this were, a, like I said, a smaller frame, I'd use an inch and a half bit. I've done uh, a, four, uh, a five by five frame, and I used an inch and a quarter bit in that one. It was a very small frame. So I'm only doing that just to kind of demonstrate how the holes are drilled. So let's come back here to this mortise that I've already drilled and have al already chiseled a portion of that out. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish this mortise now. And basically this is what we're doing. This is a six and three quarter inch wide mortise with a, with a two inch bit. So you've got three holes, six inches, and then that leaves a little bit of an overlap between the, between the drill, drill holes. You might be wondering, how sharp is that chisel? Well, what's kind of ironic, this is softwood. With softwood, you actually need a sharper chisel because the grain is uh, being soft, is a little more squashy than uh, like hardwood. Hardwood, you don't need as hard as sharp a chisel. Uh, I guess to some degree, maybe it's a bit more brittle. Uh, but for what we're doing here, I need it to be a pretty, pretty, uh, sharp bit. Now this is fighting me a little bit in the mortise because I'm actually drilling, chiseling into a knot which must be coming up from the bottom. Though I can feel it's a little more difficult, it still, still actually comes out pretty easily. You may wonder why I'm using a leather-faced mallet. Uh, you can use a wood-faced mallet. You can make your own mallet if you wish. I found that um, the wood mallets um, transmit the force that I'm exerting onto the chisel right to my elbow. All that shock goes right to my elbow. By using the leather face, you, you, you have this cast body that gives you the weight, but the leather face absorbs some of that impact. I don't feel it in my elbow at all. I very quickly started using the leather mallets. This is a two pound hammer. I'll be honest and say that 10, 15 years ago, I used a three pound hammer and I still can for an hour or so. But when it comes to all day work, I'll use the two pound hammer and it works just as well. I don't find myself having to do any more work with a two pound hammer than I would with a three pounder. But young folks tend to think they want to have a heavier hammer because it works quicker. And that's fine because we were all at one time younger folks. <laughs> so I'm just using my sharp chisel. I'm using a little bit of leverage. Getting all my pieces out of there. I'm making sure 
See how I'm sliding my chisel back and forth? It's a two inch chisel. I'm just making sure that my hole, my mortise is the correct width. Let's do the same thing with a square. I can do the same thing with a square. Okay, that's saying we're a full two inches wide, so we're good there. I'm not gonna worry about that. The next thing is I need to house this a little bit here. So I'm going to make sure that's cut, and it is. And just like I removed the material back here, I'm going to do it, but only on this one side, because now all I've got here, I don't have a timber coming all the way across this space. I only have it in this space. That brace is only going just in this narrow space. It's a four inch brace. So the shoulder plus the, the mortise is four inches. And as I said before, this wood is being very cooperative because I'm not fighting knots. I've done some additional prep work, so this is essentially good. Okay. The other thing I need to do now is because the piece coming out of this mortise is on an angle, 45 degree angle, I need to remove the shoulder so that it's not interfering with my, my brace. Okay, so let's get this stuff out of here and we're just going to do a little test fit. I'm going to take my brace. Actually, the ideal way to do this is to just turn it upside down and dump it out. Okay, so I've got my brace right here that I dropped on the floor. And I can take this, slide this down in, and it fits. Nice and good lines there. My angle is out of the way. This will come back. Well, you know what I'm noticing? I need to make sure, there it is. I need to make sure that this shoulder is plumb. Okay, it's not. This is angled. This corner is a little too far out. I noticed it because this face should be sitting tight against this, and it's not. So I need to clear a little bit more in the back side here. So let's try that again. Okay, a little more. Now remember how I said my mortise was four inches deep plus the five eighths inch shoulder. The tenon, when you cut your tenon, you always cut it an eighth of an inch less than the depth of your mortise. I say, why would you do that? Well, if there's something in the bottom of the mortise that is not quite 100%, um, that gives you an eighth of an inch that you can play with. Okay, so that's fitting properly now. Okay, so that's fitting nice in there, and eventually we're going to assemble this. We're going to put it all together. So basically, I've cut my tenon for the plate. I finished my um, mortise pocket here in the housing, and then I came down here and did my brace mortise uh, so that it'll receive this. So at this point, this particular timber is done. 
Uh, there's a couple things I want to show you on this other timber, however. So let's get this out of the way for a minute. I'm going to bring over this piece. Um, I want to talk a little bit about peg holes. One of the things that's kind of interesting about these t this timber framing technique is we do what's called draw pegging. Um, that means that the hole for the mortise is not in the same place as the hole on the tenon. And could you zoom in on this car a little bit? Right here. This is the line. And this is where I'm actually going to drill my hole. See, it's approximately an eighth of an inch toward the shoulder from the line. When I do, a, when I do the, drill the mortise, I drill it right on the line. When I drill the tenon, I come toward the shoulder an eighth of an inch. I don't know whether you can see this one here relative to the line. It looks like it's offset to the line. So now I'm going to take my boring machine with my one inch hole, one inch, um, one inch drill bit. And I'm going to bring this forward. Where are we there? There we are. I'm going to bring this bit forward. One inch bit. This, by the way, is an Ajax. This is uh, also pre-1900, pre probably around 1880-ish. I don't have the exact age on it. But now I'm going to drill that spot that I have that's about an eighth of an inch off that line and drill through my drill through my timber here. And it's fighting me a little bit because I've got a nice big knot in that corner there. I can feel it. here just make sure my thread is clean okay okay I'm gonna stop right there it's fighting me and I'm not gonna f fight it I can demonstrate what I need to with just the one peg hole uh, but like I said I had to come an eighth of an inch off that line for that particular peg hole. Now, the other thing we need to do is drill one more peg hole in the brace. And the brace is, uh, is, an, inter is an interesting issue. This is, this is my shoulder right here, but I'm also perp I got on a 45 degree angle. So I actually have to offset that hole in two directions. So I have to offset it this way and this way. So it's approximately a quarter of an inch offset right there. If all goes well, this is going to behave itself and drill my hole. Yes. We, uh, it's offset toward this shoulder. Then it needs to be offset in the direction of the brace itself. So it becomes 45 degrees so you've, you're basically coming in and down. Because I've got my mark, where's my pencil? I've got my mark here. That's where I want to have it, OK? So I come in an eighth, but, I, but then I have to go this way. So I basically am swinging it over this way as well. So it's in and, and then oriented in this direction. So it, it looks like a lot more than an eighth of an inch, but when it, when it gets put together, You'll see that it uh, its offset is uh, is good. Okay. Right there. It's always easier to do the the line up the bar the tip on these bits when you got a second person doing it with you. I tend to when I teach my classes, I always have people work together. Two people work together which allows them to uh, be watching each other. OK, so there we go. So we 
we've got, I believe we now have everything ready to go here. Yeah. Yes. Yes, the chat room is open. People can ask questions. Uh, we do have a moderator there who can uh, accept your questions. So here's the next thing. We're going to actually assemble this now. Get this back over there. I'm good there. I'm just kind of getting things oriented here. One thing I didn't mention is that whenever we, whenever we um, lay out, we always lay out from a reference face. And you can see my bird's mouth here on this corner. So these are, if it's either, this whole frame is referenced off this face and this face. All my layout, see how this is two inches and then two inches. See how my housing is laid out from this face. My housing over here is laid out from this face. So what I can do is I'm actually going to start putting this particular joint together. I'm just going to set that in there because I'm now going to come over here. Uh, where are my pegs? They're in the pail, right here. After we put this together, we're gonna <coughs> we're gonna do a quick little peg demo. But this way, see how I've just I've just started that together, started this together, and started this. So I can pull this in now, and that is there. That is there. And then you bring out one of your persuaders. This, there we go. So if you can see here, the joint's kind of tight. This one's fairly tight. This one's not real tight yet. But what I'm going to do is take some pegs. I'm going to put a peg in this hole. And you'll see what, as I put these in, I want to go through the top of the mortise, through the tenon, and into the mortise beyond. Because the worst thing you can do is not have it through the tenon and you're driving into the body of the timber. The two problems with that is you can't go very far. And then the other problem is it'll probably get stuck and you are done. So I'm going to put this in here and put that there. So I'm through and started. So all three of these are started. This one I wasn't able to finish that hole. So that's as far as we're going to go. So if I tap this, I don't know whether you were you able to visualize that? But right here, uh, I don't know whether you, uh, can you visualize that joint? As I tap it, it pulls it together. And it's the same thing here. As I tap this, see how it pulls that joint together? Gets tighter and tighter as I drive it. And then, see we're tight here. tight there and tight there and if you listen to the pegs I call it tuning the pegs I know they're tight when they're all the same pitch okay and now what you've done if you feel underneath the pin the pegs are through the hole the pegs are not identical but they're similar So the other thing I tend to do is, uh, well, as, as I'm pre-assembling things, I'll lightly peg them just to kind of hold it in place. And then when we actually raise it up, 
we'll drive it tight, and then a week later we'll come back and tighten them again. I'm using locust pegs here. You want to use hardwood for this. Ash is great because it, it splits very uniformly, uh, but uh, I prefer the, the locust because the locusts you can use inside and outside. It's very rot resistant. Uh, the pine is, is fine as long as it's not sitting in the weather. Uh, but the pegs themselves, I seem to get a little more weather in them. And I've seen ash pegs fail uh, if they're in the weather. I did a project for my daughter, and I used ash pegs. And they lasted about six years. If th we have time, I'll show that project. I built her a western red cedar deck from reclaimed telephone poles. Um, so let's take a step back and talk about these housings again. These housings allow this to be a uniform dimension up here and here and here. And by doing that, I am standardizing the timbers. All the braces are identical because this is a, I'm reaching for my ruler here. This is a 30 inch brace going from there down to here, 30 inches. Going from there over to here, 30 inches, right to this edge of this timber. Um, and uh, when it comes to the housing, I have an 8 by 8, and I let it down to 7.5. I let it down to 7.5 and 7.5. So it's all uniform. So I know my braces, it, if that's a 30-inch brace, it'll fit anywhere a 30-inch brace needs to go in a building. If it were a scribe rule, I would have to scribe that brace into the post and the tie, and that's the only place it could go. Okay, I'm going to spend a couple minutes now. I'm going to drop, Carl, I'm going to have you help me drop this off of here. I just want to slide it over. Let's get the, uh, which, I just want to get this out of the way and we can set it up against the wall here. I'm going to use that right now. Just, yeah, that's fine. I want to, I want to slide this off onto the ground. Yep, yeah, we're going to come right down. You're going to get, set that right down to the ground there. So set your end down. Okay? So and that's we can let that sit just like that. So pegs are always driven from the reference face. Now I want that, yes, please. And what I'm gonna do now is talk a little bit about how I make pegs. Uh yeah, perfect. Uh let's go 180 on that. Let's swip flip it around. Yep. Perfect. This is called a shaving horse. It's a critical tool for a lot of applications, but really important for pegs. I, oh, let's start out, let's do this. I have a piece of locust here that I split out of a, a chunk this morning. You can see I've got marks on it here for one inch pegs. All my holes are one inch. And what I do is I have a, a tool called a shake fro. This tool is, uh, if you've heard of a shake fro, it is literally for making shake shingles. Okay, I would put that on there and I drive it down through and then peel that off. And then drive it through and peel it off. And at this point, after I've made that larger piece, I can use my hatchet to finish it up. So what I'm gonna do here is, uh, because I do, this is called writhing. I'm writhing out a peg. And I have, as I said, all my marks are one inch apart. So what I can do now is I can take this piece that's kind of still stuck together and I can make this basically drive it out into four pieces. So these are riven, riven pieces that uh, now I need my draw knife and climb up on my shaving horse 
And the nice thing about the shaving horse is this is like a, a, a vice. It's a foot vice. I put it like that. My What I usually do is I'll, now this is a little rectangular. I'm going to kind of clean it up and make it a little, a little square. What I'm very good at is making kindling wood. I make a lot of kindling wood doing this. So what I end up with is a reasonably square piece of wood. And the critical thing to me is my grain is going from there all the way to here. The grain is perfectly down through because I rived it. If uh, you can buy turned pegs, but there's no guarantee that the grain goes the length of the peg. It could be on an angle, the grain, and if it's on an angle, first time you hit it, the peg will collapse. They don't tend to do that, but it can. So what I'm doing now is I'm a, kind of attempting to simulate a round peg. I'm making this octagonal. So I, I don't know if you can see that on the camera. That's octagonal. It's octagonal in the dimension. Same thing on both ends. Then I take this and I say, okay, which is the smaller end? This is pretty uniform. Because I'm going to put that end down there and never touch it again. All the work I'm doing now is only going to be on this end. So now I'm going to draw on every single corner. Mr. Kim? Excuse me? What kind of wood is that you're working locus, with? Locus. Locus. Okay. This is locus. And uh, so I've got it tapered some. And now I need to taper it a little bit more, so I'm down at the last quarter to third of the peg. The goal being to make it small enough so I can get it through the through the uh, mortise, the, the two-inch mortise, through the two-inch tenon, and into the material beyond it. Okay. I didn't mean to throw you on the floor, folks. <laughs> So, after I've got my peg made, which I do now, now that I'm now properly dressed, yeah, let's, whoop, I just, <laughs> pull that, put it in my pocket, put that in my pocket. Now I have my peg made, since I don't have a mortise to work in, on, on the face of my shaving horse I have a bunch of holes here for the different size pegs I made. I drop it in that hole. I want to go at least halfway, and this goes a hair over half, which says it's a little small, but that's not a problem, because there are times when the peg holes are misaligned more than others, and you need a small peg. So let's do this again. And you see what I'm doing is sometimes it fights me. I'll pull it and I'll lift, lift up the spoke, the uh, draw knife a little bit, and that kind of peels that piece off. And one more time. Okay. Sometimes in timber frames, they never, they only work from one side. And this end stays square. They just, they don't even bother going to that end. You find that in some of your older frames. I have uh, some pictures from uh, the Episcopal Church in Duanesburg, which is 18, 1790s, scribe rule frame. And that frame has, some pegs are octagonal on both ends, but some of the pegs are square on that one end. So I'll just do this one that way. I don't think I needed to wear a flannel shirt today. OK. 
Okay. So, and that one goes a little over a third of the way. So that peg is done as well. If, uh, when you get good at this, you can make pegs at about a minute and a half a piece. And that includes riving them from the, billet, from the block of wood. Basically, it's just a chunk of firewood that's about a foot long. How's our time, Carl? Just about 8 o'clock. What time? I'm sorry? We started late, so you can have some more time. Okay. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I've demonstrated some of the joinery. Uh, we've assembled that piece. Do you want to look at some of the slides now? So I'm going to go off camera, and we're going to, I'll talk a little bit to some of these pictures that I have. Uh, some of it's work I've done. Most of it, it's work people have done 200 years ago. So, okay, is that visible online now? Yep. Okay, this, remember how I talked about scribe rule versus square rule? The right hand frame, you can see how the tenons at the top of the posts are notched into the plate that runs across there. You can see how the braces are notched into the posts, how the tie beam is notched in. That's square rule on the right hand side. I refer to that as modern timber framing. Modern in the sense that since 1820. That is pretty much the technique that is used today in timber framing. Um, on the left hand side is the, the method is a very simplistic picture of the method of the scribe rule. And if you notice at the top of the post where it comes into the plate, the, uh, there, the post is uh, in alignment with the bottom of the plate. That's one of the very sure indications that's that scribe rule. Because rather than housing, the housing allows you to be more universal and more flexible in your construction, like in the square rule, but in the scribe rule, you're literally taking a post, you're taking a tie beam and the braces, you're going to lay them out on saw horses. You're then going to, uh, uh, you're then going to uh, scribe, literally scribe. They used an all very commonly. Scribe dimensions from the post into the tie beam, from the post into the braces. Then you take it apart, you cut all your joinery, then put it back together. And when everything is back together and it's square and plumb, you literally scribe across that joint. I'll show you some examples of that with the awl, or you could use a chisel and put numbers there. So let's go to the next. Yes. Switch to, switch to you and just talk to him. I'm sorry? Talk to the camera. We do have, okay. we do have okay. a couple of questions in the chat. Okay, you have go ahead. Um, Rich says, in creating the housing to accurately cut to the proper depth, I have seen the timber turned on its side and, and, a, and a scribe saw used to cut the proper depth. Would you advocate this method? A scribe saw? I'm not familiar with that. Okay. I'm not familiar with a scribe saw. Uh, Rich says, I have used three-quarter oak dowels for pegs. Any problem with this? Well, the only issue is that you better make sure that the grain runs the length of the, uh, of the dowel. If the, gra if the grain is on a diagonal on, uh, on the dowel, it's, it's likely to disintegrate when you try to drive it into a hole. Last question from Rich. Yes. When insulating a timber frame, do you advocate use of SIB, structural Sips. insulated panels? If not, what method? Uh, you're talking about SIPs. Uh, my house is a timber frame with SIPs on the outside of it. Uh, so that the, it's little, the SIPs are literally nailed to the outside of the building. Uh, so, my, so my timbers are fully exposed. And it also gives an opportunity for fully insulated, you know, it's like an envelope around the structure. So, so yeah, I, uh, SIPs I think are great. So let's go next. How do we progress here? Okay, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, how do we? Oh, okay. Ah, did I mess you up? Okay, start the show. Okay, very good. This is a. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some old barns. This this is a former barn that used to be in Middleburg. As you cross the Schoharie Crook on 180, 145, looking west, this barn used to be on your on in the farm there. This got burned to the ground as a result of Irene by uh, the hay catching on fire, spontaneous combustion. This barn itself is 100 feet long. If you look the, down the roof line, 
You'll see where it dips about three quarters of the way down. The original Dutch barn is before the dip. The second, uh, the last third there was an addition that was put on. Um, and we'll see a little bit of that inside. But this, this is a Dutch barn. Um, you can see the, uh, see, actually, I think that's me standing there on what appears to be a floor. That is, they dropped the, the roof level down below the, the beams so they had more room for hay. But you can look at this. This is a scribe rule building. Um, uh, so uh, it, it is post-Revolutionary War because uh, this barn was actually, if there was one here, it was burned at the end of the Revolutionary War as the British uh, retreated to Canada. Uh, on the right-hand picture, you see holes in the posts. Those are referred to as raising holes. Likely there was a peg in there, then ropes were tied to it when the building was assembled. Its only function is for raising the building. Okay, so uh, let's go there. This is just a number, another view from the side aisle. Um, in, in the very, this is a seven bay barn. There were, there were, I'm sorry, seven bents, six bays. So each of these vertical posts, tie beams, and braces are referred to as a bent. Uh, so every 10 feet, this is 70 foot long Dutch barn, 50 by 70 foot was what its dimensions are. One of the things that I like, uh, really like, is in the very bottom center, you can see the outside aisle uh, right over there. And uh, see that post. And notice how all the exterior braces radiate outward from that center. The, the uh, right ones go from the top left to the bottom right, and the left ones go from the top right to the bottom left. I've not seen that methodology used. Um, and you'll also notice the studs, those outside wall members are called studs. Um, basically, every third one aligns with the, uh, with the tie beams, those big tie beams in front of you. So there's interior studs um, between, uh, between those uh, those tie beams. This is just another view of the same thing. You can see on the right hand side here this, uh, this tie beam here. The other thing that's neat is this up here. This structure was added for the addition. So that was added so that they could make another timber frame structure and have it tied directly into the original building. We got 10 minutes? Okay, very good. We'll One see more what. question from Rich. Sure. In creating the housing, to accurately cut the proper depth, I have seen a timber, the timber turn on its side and a skill saw used to cut to the proper depth. Would you advocate this method? No. The reason I don't like skill saws is, um, first of all, I need to have electricity. Secondly, I need hearing protection, uh, face uh, eye protection. Uh, it is, it's, because it's a round blade, you can't get to the depth of the hole. Um, it's, there's a lot of disadvantages to it. People think it's quicker, but the reality is if you have a boring machine, you can do it much quicker. The exception being you can use a chainsaw mortar center, uh, which costs about $3,000, uh, but then you need 240 volt, and uh, now I need my hearing protection and my eye protection and the whole, the whole you know, and you've got to watch your fingers. I don't have issues with my boring machines that way. They're not as fast. At the end of the day, I'm physically tired, but... I don't have any hearing issues. So I definitely advantages if you're doing this commercially to those quicker methods. I don't do it commercially. I do it for the, uh, I, I guess I'm a traditionalist when it comes to the tools. Thank you. Sure. Uh, this is just another shot on the outside wall. Um, and then this is the opposite side. And then in the middle of this picture, you see a hole. I always look for that. That is the threshing pole hole uh, when they were threshing the grain, because these were grain barns for making wheat. The Europeans, the Dutch came here to the U.S. to make, to grow wheat, because they were running about out of arable land in Europe. The population was exploding, so they would come here to grow grain. And the other side is they would build their barn, then they would build the house, because they needed to get to work to make the grain, then they'd build the house. But the raising pole, uh, the, the threshing pole, it would literally be a pole, and then you'd drop your grain around the pole, and I can't remember what you'd call that item, that you'd roll around over the grain, the, uh, the, the sheaves of grain, to separate the wheat from the chaff. So it's, it's pretty neat. Now this is a perfect example of a timber frame that is pretty tired. 
This is my brother-in-law's barn that I restored for him back uh, probably 15 years ago. Uh, dry rot. Uh, this particular building was approximately two feet out of plumb. Uh, one end of the building, the foundation had collapsed, and it was two feet low. Uh, I was able to jack the building up and get it back to within one inch of level. And the building without substantial, not, I did, we didn't need cables. We, didn't, we put cables on it, but we didn't need them. Um, it, uh, the building itself came back to within four inches of plumb just by raising the floor up to that within one inch. But over to the right, you can just see how I use scaffold to hold the tie beam up here because there's, if you notice, there's no post here, no post here, no post here. That was completely gone and rotted out. Uh, so I had to replace the end post, the interior post. All the upper members were decent. Um, so let's go next here. And this is just, the, uh, this is the, the finished structure. We recited it. You can see off to the left, the tie beam, I've got a, uh, uh, a wedged scarf. It's got a much longer name. I'm not going to talk to that right now. But you can also see over in this corner here where there's some cleaner wood. That is what's referred to as a Dutchman repair because that tenon, the, the tenon and both the mortise were gone. So I had to create a new pocket. And then this, this uh, attachment here actually projects into the mortise and then gets bolted to the, uh, to the brace. And the same thing on the other side. You can see where I place, uh, because I had to put a new post on this side, I put this, this scarf on there, this half lap, which is basically a tenon into, that, uh, into the mortise and the post. Uh, what else? This is a pretty cool barn. This is in Voorheesville. Uh, some of you may have seen it being moved several years ago. It, got, it was part, originally on the Albany Country Club, or the Colony Golf Course property. It was given to the town of Orisville and moved across the street. This structure is 60 by 120. It's about a 1910 barn, so it's not really old. It's just remarkable. If you go inside here, this is interior picture. On the left-hand side, you see a tie beam right across here. This is the tie beam that goes all the way across. That tie beam is 60 feet long. There is no interior post on that tie beam. But if you notice, right here, see this brace here? And on the other end, there's another brace tied to this upper member. That creates a truss. So basically, that didn't need a post under it. Um, so you ended up with a totally supporting structure. All the other bents in the building had interior posts in the center of the building. But that one, uh, that post did not. Um, this is just an example of the pegs where the tie beams came together. You can also see right here the radius from the circular saw. This was circular sawn, which is definitely post-1900. This, the, the, this is why I call these barns cathedrals. This, uh, my father-in-law had a 30 by 40 barn. Six of them would have fit inside the structure. It, it's just absolutely amazing to me how massive this is. It's got, and uh, you'll see, you can see it out here a little bit. It has, it has your regular plate on the outside wall. It has this interior post with a plate on it. Then it has what's called a flying plate. If you take this tie beam out, there's another plate out here, so a purlin plate. So there's literally four purlin plates and two pl uh, regular plates on the outside wall. It's because the ceiling, the roof is so massive. The, I'm told that the, sh the, the slate shingles on the roof of this way between 30 and 40 tons. So it's just an amazing structure. This is just another view of the same building. They've done a lot of, this is being completely redone. This is when it was still over on the County Country Club property. You can see where they put a lot of angle iron and stuff to try to stabilize it because the roof had started to leak and it's missing shingles. Shingles are falling off all the time. And here's one, talking to members of the guild, the Timber Framers Guild, they said no one had a 60 foot long circular saw. It was impossible, no one had one. They said, go down the length of that 60 foot tie beam and look at it very closely. I'm not sure you can notice it, but you can see where the white paint is and you can see the radius of the saw, top right to lower left. If you come over here, it's top right to lower, top left to lower right. Right in here, it changes direction. 
that ladder is approximately 40 feet from the front of the building. So they literally cut 40 feet into the, pole, into the timber, took it off the sawmill, turned it around, and sawed from the opposite direction. Mr. Kim, got a question for you. Sure. Um, question is, I've seen many old barns collapse over the years. I think she's saying with the timber beam construction you've demonstrated. Any comments about that? Absolutely. Uh, normally the buildings fail because the roof fails. Uh, and if you lose the roof, you lose your rafters, and now you're exposing your timbers. Um, tie beams are absolutely critical. If you're missing a tie beam or two, the whole building is going to collapse. If you start, uh, you know, you see the, the metal roof getting blown off of buildings, that's just kind of the beginning of its demise. It's really unfortunate. Um, people don't have money to maintain these things. It's expensive. Uh, it's sad. And as my wife says, you know, why would you keep it if you didn't have a use for it? You know, because it's a lot of money. You could spend $100,000 restoring a building, and if you don't have a reason to restore it, uh, you know, I, I guess I can understand not doing it. So that's, you know, that's part of that. This is another building. Uh, I don't know how much time we got. Short. Okay. This is probably the last one we're going to look at here. This is what's called a swing beam barn. You can see this very large beam. This is also scribe rule. Once again, you can look at the top of the post there and see that it mates uniformly with the bottom of the plate, which is, as I said, an indication of scribe rule. This is a 38-foot wide barn unsupported in the middle, but you've got this large upper timber. There's a stud here, and over here just out of view is another stud, which creates a truss, which supports that lower beam. This is a transition from the Dutch barns, where there was no interruption underneath, to the English barns, where there's an interior post. Every other bent in the building has a post in the center. So in on the right, in the middle right here, you can see a tie beam was taken out. You can still see the tenon, and you can see how there was probably weighing on the timber. So they, they, they cut the post uh, housing so that it kind of aligned with the, uh, with the material at the end there. Uh, this Kim, is, we had a question from Rich. Um, as a traditionalist, do you use a front end loader or, for real, or a forklift? <laughs> frames, or do you just use manpower to raise it? Uh, 20 years ago, I, I think I'm done. I'm getting tired here. I'm sorry. I, I, okay, I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm getting hot. Um, so. Thank you for joining us. Yes. The YouTube video will still be up on YouTube, so you can come back to it and view it at any time in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Wow. I'm very hot.